with me. Uh, you may have heard some of this last week, um, but a lot has happened since then. A lot. <laughs> okay. Um, I'll try to keep this as short as I can. Here's somebody else trying to get in. Quinesha is here. So let me find my thing so I can get her here. Quinesha is here. All right. Good deal. Um, now, I don't know. <laughs> Two separate but now they're interlocking things have happened in the last week week and a half something like that okay uh, I'll try to hit this as quickly as possible I knew I had a doctor's appointment coming up with my hematologist about my uh, leukemia and uh, so Friday a week ago I went in to do the blood work so he would have that on Tuesday of last week for our, our um, telemedicine conference I knew I was going to need a treatment because my counts were a little high the last time, but that was three or four months ago. Uh, so I figured they had gone up some more, so we would need a treatment this time. Well, we saw the results before we saw him, and they, the white blood cell counts have gone skyrocketed and the, probably are suppressing the red blood cells, the hemoglobin, the hematocrits, and the platelets. They're all way low, so I'm fairly anemic very anemic right now and that's probably the part of the reason I've been sort of tired and having to you know boost you know with caffeine and sugar and stuff just to keep going uh, I didn't realize that because it was happening so slowly but that must be the problem okay so that's happening well I met with the doctor and he was concerned had me go back in for more blood work to make sure the Anemia was not something because of the disease of the treatment that it was just, you know, thing. it turned out fine. He also wanted to have check on the white cells to make sure they were still the same uh, malignant white cells and that he wasn't going to treat the wrong thing. They were the same. So they scheduled me for a treatment, but unfortunately with the counts as high as they are, they say I'm going to need to take the treatment in two consecutive days. And that's the bad news, especially for this class, because right now I am scheduled for a treatment to start 7 o'clock Thursday morning. And then the second one will be on Friday morning. So, and they have to have them two days back to back. They do 10% on Thursday and 90% on Friday. So there goes my our class, there goes my office hours, there goes just about everything for the end of this week okay so that's one issue and that's you know pretty much can't avoid it now we can talk about whether we want to try to make up the class somehow uh, I'll be quite willing to do that so we'll talk about that in a minute so be mulling that over here's the second thing that happened last week a really good dear friend of ours um, who's a member of our Sunday school class for more than two decades, um, died. Uh, well, she collapsed at the church parking lot on Tuesday evening. She had been at a Bible study, and then she they rushed her to the emergency room. Um, they stabilized her, put her at the ICU, and then here's Janae coming in. Janae is here. All right. Good deal. All right. And uh, rush to the ICU. She has no, I think somebody else is trying to get in, but I can't see who it is. So I'm going to have to go down to this and see if I can get them this way. Yeah. Shay is coming in. So let me admit her. All right. Well, I thought, I, yeah, she's joining now. So anyway, uh, then I found out when I was teaching later on Thursday of last week that uh, that she died. Now, why am I telling y'all that? Well, I was. She has no living relatives in the state of Alabama. 
She was the very last child, a surprise late in her parents' marriage. Whatever siblings she had were very much older than her, like she hardly knew them. And she was mentally ill, somewhere in between bipolar and schizophrenic, somewhere in that spectrum of things. And I think probably much of her youth or young adult or whatever, she was probably institutionalized and who knows what kind of archaic treatments they did to people back then. It was not a good situation. Um, since then, she has learned through a, cover, a group called Recovery International how to cope with mental illness and she was doing a superb job with that. Um, and like I said, she was just a giving, caring, beautiful person, but had that really major disability. And she named me as her contact person if anything were to happen to her. So therefore, I'm kind of having to arrange memorial service at the church, a memorial service at the Episcopal place, even though the the pastors and the chaplains are going to be doing most of the work. They need my input on that. Um, we're trying to figure out what to do with her artwork. She was an artist. We're trying to figure out what to do with her furniture. I think Episcopal Place is going to sort of take the ball on that one and take care of that pretty much too. But I have to be there to give permission and stuff like that. Um, so, uh, and then I'm dealing with UAB because she donated her body to, to science, so UAB is going to be using it. Um, so I've got to do paperwork for that. And it seems like there's a few other irons in the fire that, that I have to deal with. So that's been going on this week. And of course, it's happening on the week when I have to have a treatment. And so that wipes out. See, I would do most of this on Friday, but Friday's going to be completely wiped out. So I'm having to do as much as I can before then and some probably next week. She lived in a HUD subsidized apartment and HUD's requirement, that's house, Housing and Urban Development, requires you to clear the apartment 14 days after the death. So we're trying to see if we need to get in touch with the sister, if the sister is even still alive. She was living in Virginia. We didn't, no one knows her name. You know, Judy only mentioned her to a couple of people. And that's the only reason we know she had a sister. We don't know any more information about her. We are seeing if we need to get lawyers involved because we don't want to get in trouble for moving her furnishings, which we've got to do in two weeks um, if someone else wants a, a claim to it. I don't think they will, but we're having to cover those bases too. So anyway, it's pretty much a mess, um, but I would do anything for Judy, so I'm you know, not going to complain about it, but it just is eating up time. So here's why I'm telling you this, okay? Ladarius is coming in, so let me get him here. Okay, the bottom part of the alphabet is here strong. The top part of the alphabet is here strong, missing a few in the middle. So hopefully... Uh, they will be coming in shortly. So here's the deal. Okay, number one, a lot of my office hours so far this week have been eaten up with having to deal with some of this stuff because my office hours are during the working day. And that's the only time I can deal with the social workers, the chaplains, the uh, pastors, the um, UAB, and everybody else who, who needs information. I have to do that during the working day, and unfortunately, that's during my office hours. I wish I could do it in the evenings, but I can't because they're not in the offices then. So yesterday morning, I guess I had close to half of my office, well, no, more than half of it was spent on that math, that stuff. Yesterday afternoon, though, I had more of my time to spend, so that was fine. Today, I know I have a phone uh, conference with the chaplain at Episcopal Place. So that's going to take a little while. I don't think it'll take long, but I know we've got a phone meeting then. Other than that, I'll be in the office. I list them as one to three. My lunch is in there somewhere. Uh, 
and uh, and then the phone call will be in there somewhere but other than that I'll try to get working on things but then tomorrow from 8 to 10 my normal office hours hopefully I won't have too much of this to do so I should be in the office then but the four to six o'clock time frame completely out I've got to meet with a guy from the church who's really good with photography and computer stuff he's going to go with me to her apartment and take pictures of all her artwork so people who want to get a piece of her artwork can do so see what it's like and get it so we will be doing that and maybe taking a picture of some of the furniture in case any of the ministries of the church can use the furniture for anyone who you know say house burned or anything else that they need something she didn't have much and it wasn't super good quality but someone might be able to use it so I'm having to deal with that tomorrow afternoon so my office hours in the morning are okay but in the afternoon are gone four to six I'll be at Episcopal place most of that time frame and then like I said Thursday and Friday completely gone I'll be at UAB uh, clinic now I'm hoping hoping to be through by three o'clock tomorrow afternoon now what kind of shape I'll be in I don't know because they give me Benadryl for the before they do the uh, the infusion and that always knocks me out but if I can get enough sleep done there at the clinic then I'm gonna try to get home by three and maybe teach my 315 class don't try to but I don't know if I'll make it or not a couple of you I think are in that class so uh, we're meeting today for sure and hopefully we'll meet on on uh, Thursday as well but we'll talk about that in class today then Friday when I normally have office hours from 8 to 12 completely wiped out that's gonna be the 90 percent treatment that's gonna take the full day um, they don't start me until 8 15 Friday I don't know why I guess they were too full on Friday so 8 15 and I'll probably be there way past four o'clock um, maybe even close to five o'clock so there goes Friday altogether and then when I get home after the 90 percent treatment I have a feeling I'll be going to bed and and sleeping off the rest of the Benadryl so anyway that's where I am and that's why things are a little slow and behind this week so sorry I took so much time to say it and here's a phone call coming in now yeah Okay. Okay. Um, it was about that. It was a social worker, but she texted, so I don't have to respond to that. Okay. Anyway, that may be happening all during class. All right. Any questions, issues, problems, concerns? What do you. I hear something else. Yeah. Just call after call. I'll have to catch them. There goes part of my office hours this afternoon uh, from 1 to 3. Cause Say that one more time. What is due in November? Okay. Um, I don't know what you mean by that. The first test you should be wrapping up. Say again. What what is it that says that? Okay. What? Okay. I have absolutely no control over WebAssign. That's something that that. Yeah, but the thing is. Yeah. That's that's for that is well. If you turn it in, um, one of you, I think it's Shamari, regularly turns in that as her homework assignment, and that's perfectly fine. Absolutely, absolutely, whatever floats your boat. Okay, but I didn't do any of the setup on on WebAssign. Why in the world they put a November date on there? That's absolutely crazy. But uh, 
I don't know. Uh, I don't understand Cengage or WebAssign or how they do the things they do. But uh, the guy that I've worked with is really good. I don't know why he would have done that. I'll see if I can get in touch with him and have him extend those to the end of the term. Uh, but no, you can work on that to your heart's content. Like you said, that's for your benefit, for your practice. Uh, and you can do that instead of the homework problems, in addition to the homework problems, however you want to. You can turn in whatever you want to, either web assign or this, whatever you feel like you get the most benefit from. That's what I want you to use. That's why I do web assign. So you can, you can benefit from that. Absolutely. I mean, I just want you to practice, practice, practice. I don't know if you ever took piano or some instrument. I bet you your music teacher said, practice, practice, practice. Well, that's what your math teacher says. Practice, practice, practice. How and where and what you use to practice, whatever you find benefits you the most, that's what I want you to use. So, yes, you can. Yes. Okay. Uh, somebody, something, some application, it's open to you. You, I would have hoped you to pick the topic by now, but if you haven't, find you a topic and go. It can be person, event, um, application, uh, phenomenon, anything that has to do with precalculus algebra in some way, shape, or form. Uh, and yeah, people are fine, and what they did, how they did it, why they did it, who uses it, any of those kind of things are perfectly good, wide open topics. I want you to relate it to something you're interested in. If you're interested in the people part, do the people part. If you're interested in the application part, do the application part. You know, find something that, that strikes your fancy, has to be connected somehow with uh, precalculus algebra. Okay, so that's that's the only caveat. It could go as far as calculus. It could go forward, backward, whichever way you want to go. But be sure that you, uh, yeah, you just one to two pages and double spaced and twelve point twelve pitch font. Right. Be sure you have at least one page of text which will go on to the second page because wherever you start typing on this page, you have to come down at least that far on the second page to be a page of text. Okay, so it will be two pieces of paper or front and back or whatever. I'll decide how to, to print those out, but uh, yeah, that's what you'll need. Okay, great question so far. Any others? Okay, did I answer all of them adequately? I couldn't tell if I did or not. Okay, all right, where we're starting today, I'm pretty sure, because <laughs> I have two marks on the page, we did example six both on the PowerPoint and on in the book, I think last time, but we were starting to do example seven, if I'm not mistaken, and that's not on the slide set, so... I'm going to go to the, and let me make sure I've got 19 students here. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19. Got it. So I think I got everybody. So let's go to the whiteboard. And now I've got some more moving around to do. Let me take this toolbar, taskbar, whatever you call it, and move it as far out of the way as I can. And then you can't see this, either one of them, but now my whiteboard, because I've got some of your names and uh, icons up, I've got mine, and I have a limited amount of white space, so I try to put it in the middle where I can work on it. All right, I think someone, I think someone has this microphone on, you may not realize it, okay? I believe it may be you, Terrell. Terrell. 
Okay. I think you're unmuted and whatever the noise in the background is coming through. All right, let's do example seven. If there's no further questions, let's do example seven. All right. So, okay, is your memory the same that we did example six, both the one on the PowerPoint and the one in the book, and now we're moving to example seven. Is that right? Okay. I hear no objections, so I'm going to do it. So find the inverse function. Okay, great. Thank you. Of f of x is equal to the square root of 2x minus 3. Okay, now the other thing we never did get back to, I think I asked it, but we got off into something else. Are y'all wanting to make up the class that we're going to miss on Thursday? Because we will miss it on Thursday for sure. I'll be in the clinic. Um, just think about this. I've got Friday mornings I can do it. Not this Friday, but other Fridays. I've got Monday morning, Monday afternoon, Tuesday, Monday and Monday and Wednesday, four to uh, eight to ten and four to six, Tuesday and Thursday one to three, and Friday eight to twelve. Uh, so let me know if you want to make it up to class. I'll be glad to do that, and if so, when. So, anyone got an opinion right now? Okay, Terrell, Terrell, I think your microphone's still on. Okay, thanks. Okay, so as soon as you let me know, speak up now or anytime. Okay, say again. Okay, I said if you want to make up Thursday's class, let me know if you want to make it up and when you want to make it up. I'm available Monday and Wednesday, 8 to 10 and 4 to 6. I'm available Tuesday and Thursday, 1 to 3. And I'm available Friday from 8 to 12. Uh, so if you want to make up Thursday's class, that's my fault. I have an appointment. I can't avoid it. Uh, it's not a school thing. It's me. So I'll be glad to make up the class for you. So y'all think about it. And at the end of the class, I'll ask you again. Let me know if you want to make it up and when you want to make it up. Okay? Everybody got it? All right. We're looking for the inverse of this function. Okay? Now, the first thing we've got to do is make sure it's a one-to-one -one function. And a couple keys here. Okay? One key is this is only a positive square root. It's not plus or minus. Okay? Positive square root. Okay? Principal square root, they call it. Now, of course, there is a limited domain here. This thing under the radical has to be non-negative. So how we write that in math speak would be, I'll write it here, 2x minus 3 has to be greater than or equal to 0. It cannot be negative. So it has to be positive or 0. Then add 3 to both sides. That doesn't mess up the direction here. Okay, so that gives you 2x is greater than or equal to 3. And then divide by 2, both sides, and you have x is greater than or equal to 3 halves. Okay, so there's your domain. Now, when it is equal to 3 halves, 2 times 3 halves is 3. 3 minus 3 is 0, that's 0, and from there on it's increasing. So you don't have to draw the graph, but if you can think through it and say, yeah, the larger the thing under the radical, the larger the square root. Okay? So yeah, it is a one-to-one -one function. That answers that question. If you doubt me, then here is a picture of it in the book. If I can get it to show up. Where is it? There it is. Nope. There it is, okay. It's the one on the bottom there. The square root, and see it starts at three halves, one and a half, and goes up from there. Okay, so there is our function. It is one to one. 
so we can proceed. What's the next step? And the rules are right across the page from you. Okay. First, it says use a horizontal line test. We didn't actually graph it, but you could have, and you'd see that would be the case. Number two, replace the f of x. What is f of x, folks? You ought to know that one by now. What is f of x always? Y. Make that y. Y is equal to the square root of 2x minus 3. Okay? Now what? Next thing says, um, interchange the roles of x and y. So now the next step is make this the x is equal to the square root of 2y minus 3. Remember with inverse functions you exchange the coordinates. Okay, that's what we just did. The next step says solve for y. Ooh, y is buried in this square root. So let's get rid of it. Take it off from the outside first. Sort of like peeling an onion. Take off the outer part first. How do you get rid of the square root? What undoes the square root? A square. Square this and square this. And the square undoes the square root. So now we have x squared is equal to 2y minus 3. We just lost the square root sign. From here it's going to be pretty easy. We're still trying to solve for y, so let's add 3 to both sides. So that gives us x squared plus 3 is equal to 2y because these add to 0. Okay. Now all we have to do is divide by 2. Okay, that count, count divides out to be 1. So now we have y is equal to, I, I don't know how you want to do it, I think x squared plus 3 over 2 is perfectly fine, x squared plus 3 over 2. Last step, well not last step, almost the last step, change this y to your f inverse. That now is your inverse function of f. And that will be x squared plus 3 over 2. Everybody following okay now? Is this making sense? We have we have done what they said. We found the inverse of this function here to be that one right there. And you see it kind of makes sense. Whereas this had a square root in it, that has a square. Where this has a minus 3, that has a plus 3. Where this is multiplied by 2, this is divided by 2. But it's in this special order. You can't just look at it and say, oh, I know the answer to that one. Okay. Now, the one last step actually two last steps, maybe three, okay, is we need to make sure this is correct. And how we do that is take the composite of f with f inverse. Okay, what we mean by that, we take the f function and operate on this thing right here. x squared plus 3 over 2. Okay, that's just putting in what f inverse is there. Now, what does the f function tell you to do? It says to take a square root of 2 times whatever is inside the parentheses. Here it was just an x, here it's going to be this thing. So we're going to have to take the square root of x squared plus 3 over 2, 2 times the square, x, okay, 2 times x minus 3. Okay, well let's see what happens with that. First, you see the 2's divide away, and that gives us the square root of x squared plus 3 minus 3. Hey, 
plus 3 minus 3 adds to 0 and the square root of x squared is x. Yes! Okay, we got the identity function. That's what we needed to get. But we're also supposed to take f inverse of f of x. So this time we put the f of x inside. So this will be f inverse of square root of 2x minus 3. Because that was your f function from up here, right? What does the f inverse function say to do? It says to take whatever's in the parentheses, x, and square it. What we've got in the parentheses here is this thing. So this is going to be the square root of 2x minus 3, and we're going to square that. Then we're going to add 3 to it, and then we're going to divide by 2, because that's what it says to do up here. Well, first, when you square a square root, that undoes it, and that gives you 2x minus 3 plus 3, hey, over 2. Well, minus 3 plus 3 adds to 0. 2x over 2 is, again, equal to x. I'm going to use that same x there because it is almost the same x. Okay? We did it again. We did find out that f of f inverse is x and f inverse of f is x. Okay. Now, the last thing would be to plot this and see what it looks like. Okay? And if you think about it, that is a vertical shrink because you're multiplying it by one half. And what you're shrinking is the squaring function, which is your basic of parabola, moved up three units and then you shrunk it. Well, guess what? Oh, and remember, remember this, folks. This is only, remember here, the x's were always, let me write it, <laughs> I'm trying to write it down without my pad being there. Remember here, the x's were greater than or equal to 3 halves. And that means that, remember when we flip, reversed everything around, that is what your f inverse is now. This has to always be positive, okay? Um, the f inverse does. So you can't go over here to the negative side, okay? And that's what the book was showing before. I don't know if you picked it up when you saw it, but there is, here is the square root function down here. Here's that quadratic, the parabola up here, starting off at 0, 3 halves, okay, and going up from there. Remember, we did have a vertical shrink, a, a vertical shift, but the vertical shift was <laughs> you had to shrink it, so where it was moving up 3, it now only moves up 3 halves. Okay, I'll show you another way to look at that. Uh, and I said that was as good a way to write it as any, but if you did it this way, you'll see a little bit more clearly if I can find my pen. There it is. You could have written this as one half of x squared plus three halves. So now you see the vertical shift is only up three halves. It's not shifting up three, shifting up three halves, and then one half of that, that's the vertical shrink, okay? And that's moved up three halves unit. So that's what you saw in there. And sure enough, pick up the book again. Sure enough, that parabola here and this square root function here, they are mirror images of each other across the line. Y is equal to X, which is exactly what we got on the screen. We found out the, the, they reflect across the identity function. Y is equal to X. All right. Any questions on that one? OK. 
okay um, there is a checkpoint just like for all the exercises there it is please do the checkpoints okay there's a summary there pretty good information there too flip one page and you see we're through with the section 1.9 here are the vocabulary questions, okay? These are all fill in the blanks. So if you have your book, read along with me. But if you don't have the book, I'll try to read slowly so you can understand. Now, if f of g of x and g of f of x both equal x, then the function g is the blank function of the function f. What would they in the blank? What's the title of this section? Anyone got a book open? 1.9, the name of it is? Anyone see that? Inverse function. The inverse function. Boy, here's another phone call. hoping to do the same thing all right I'll get back to them later okay number two the inverse function f of f is denoted by what is the symbology that we use for f well if you're still looking at the screen there it is this is f of x this will be the inverse of f f and the superscript minus one of x. That's what we mean. That's how we represent the uh, inverse function of f. Okay? That doesn't mean 1 over f. No. Okay. That's what it means for numbers or variables, but not for functions. Goodness gracious. Would ever quit ringing. I'm going to have to talk with her later today. So there goes my 1 to 3. To, uh, time period uh, office hours probably I'm gonna have to call the chaplain and the social worker okay all right number three the domain of F is the blank of F inverse the domain of F is the blank of F inverse if you're interchanging the X and the Y what does the domain become the range and the blank of f inverse is the range of f what would that be I think I put all of you to sleep this early in the morning the domain. domain perfect perfect number four the graphs of f and f inverse are reflections of each other in the line what line is that y is equal to x, the identity function. That's what I showed you before in the book, remember? Okay. Number five, a function f is blank when each value of the dependent variable corresponds to exactly one variable of the, in, uh, one value of the independent variable. Now remember we said it the other way when we're identifying a function, but now we're saying it this way what would that function f be called? Hint. Goodness gracious, it will not quit ringing. Nine more messages. Goodness gracious. Okay. Anyone know? One to one. Excellent. You got it. Okay. And number six, a graph a graphical test for the existence of an inverse function of f is the blank line test. The test to see if it is a function, any is a function, that's a vertical line test. What's the test we use to see if it's a one-to-one -one function? Goodness gracious! 
10 more messages. Yuck. Okay, I'm sorry. What line test? Horizontal line test, you got it. So homework exercises here would be any of the odds, 7 through 13. They're all at Calc Chat, 9's at Calc View. Either 15 or 17, they're both at Calc Chat. 15's at Calc View. 19's at Calc Chat. Any of the odds, 21 to 31, they're all at Calc Chat. 33's at Calc Chat. 35's at Calc Chat. Either 37 or 39's at Calc Chat. 41 or 43 are at Calc Chat, with 41 being at Calc View. Any of the odds, 45 to 53 are at Calc Chat, 45 is at Calc View. Any of the odds, 55 to 69 are at Calc Chat, 61 is at Calc View. Any of the odds, 71 to 77 are at Calc Chat, 79 to 83 are at Calc Chat. 85 or 87 is at Calc Chat. 89 is at Calc Chat. 91 should be at Calc Chat. 93s should be at Calc Chat. Well, yeah. And then any of the odds, let's see. No. Any of the odds 95 to 99 should be at Calc Chat. And then 101 should be at Calc Chat. They gave you enough here, didn't they? Okay. Plenty of homework exercises there. Okay. Now, if you do have your book and are looking at it, you see there is a section 1.10. However, okay, we're not doing 1.10. Now, I can't remember now. Goodness gracious. It just keeps buzzing. Okay. All right. Um, we're not doing 1.10, so don't sweat that. Okay. Now, I can't remember now if I posted the test to yet or not. Has anyone checked? I posted several tests last night, and I just don't remember if I posted this one or not. I may have been waiting till we finished class today. If, if I didn't post it last night, I'll be posting it if I get a chance between 1 and 3 today. Um, because that's my office hours. Um, okay, so we're skipping 1.10. However, you can go through that looking at it. If you think it's something you need to know because of your major or what you'll be doing in the future, by all means, read and, and get into it. I'm looking at it now. I don't see anything particularly that I would see conducive of a paper topic, but if you see something, you certainly can write on that as well. It's in the book. Okay, but the book can't be your source. The book can be the source of your ideas. So you don't need to worry about the 1.10 exercises either. And again, I was looking at those, and sure enough, uh, and those are exercises yeah, I see on page 102, Newton's Law of Cooling. So you could write on who in the world Newton was, what his law of cooling was, how he developed it, who uses it, Boyle's Law, who was Boyle, how did he develop this law, who uses it? What does it do for you? Or Newton again, Newton's law of universal gravitation. So anything like that you can find in the book certainly would be a legitimate paper topic. Hooke's law, same page. Uh, who in the world was Hooke? Robert Hooke. He was a contemporary pretty much of uh, Newton, a little bit older. And I don't think he and Newton got along too well, but uh, Newton was a young upstart and Hook was the old established mathematician and Newton came along and blew them all out of the water. So I don't think they got along too well. Um, anyway, there's other things there. There's a little blurb on ocean temperatures. If you're interested in that, you certainly could write on that because it's here in the book. Fraud and identity theft, that's something done. They use pre-calculus algebra for those kind of things. Then on page 104, there's a chapter summary. Now, we didn't do sections 1, 2, or 3. If there's anything there that you need to review, this is a great place to, to, uh, to pick up a little quick review. You might want to go back to the actual section and see that. 
But anything you see here from 1.4, 1 1.5, 1 1.6, 1.7, 1.8, and 1.9, really good stuff to, to pay attention to. We didn't do 1.10, so you don't have to worry about that. Okay? Then, on page 106, starting on 106, there are review exercises. If you need a little bit more practice, you want to see a few more exercises, these are all, the odds are at Calc Chat. The odds have the answers in the back. The 1.1, 1.2, and 1.3, we did not do, but if you feel like you need to practice those, you can. But starting at 1.4, you could do either 43 or 45. They're both at Calc Chat. 47 should be at Calc Chat. 49 is at Calc Chat. 51 is at Calc Chat. 53 is at Calc Chat. Then in 1.5, 55 should be at Calc Chat, 57, 59, 61, 63, and 65. In 1 1.6, there's these should all be at Calc Chat, 67, 69. In 1.7, any of the odds, 71 to 79, they should all be at Calc Chat. In 1.8, 81, 83, or 85, they should all be at Calc Chat. From 1.9, 87, 89, 91, and 93. Okay, that's the review exercises. If you feel like you want a few more, the chapter test at the end of the chapter, beginning on page 109, in fact, it's all on 109, um, the first few of those are from 1.1 to 1.3. I think 1 through 9. Okay, those are from 1.1 to 1.3. So you don't have to worry with those if you don't want to, but if you want to, if you find that's helpful for you, do it. Beginning with question number 10 there, now I think all the chapter test questions are in the back of the book. Only the odds are at calcchat.com. So you can decide what you want to do with that. Um, but so if you started with 10, 11 should be at Calc Chat, 13 should be at Calc Chat, 15 should be at Calc Chat, uh, 17 should be at Calc Chat, 19 at Calc Chat, 21 at Calc Chat, uh, and then stop there because the rest of that is uh, uh, 1.10. So there's a few more you could practice on. There's a little blurb on page 110 on proofs and mathematics. If you're into that, you certainly are welcome to take a look at that. By the way, there's a little blurb there on the Cartesian plane, named after Rene Descartes, mentioned in the book. Therefore, it's an open paper topic. So you're certainly welcome to, to follow up on that. There's a little blurb on problem solving on page 111 and on to 112. There's another name I see there, the Heaviside function. Uh, who in the world is Heaviside? Who would have a name like that? Uh, or what did he do? How did he develop this? What difference does it make? Who uses it? Those would be potential paper topics. So now we're moving on to chapter two, polynomial and rational functions. Now chapter one was functions, okay? all kinds of functions, a whole variety of functions, graphing functions, doing other things. One point, or in chapter two, we're going to focus down on two types of functions, polynomial functions, rational functions. Okay, we'll define what they are in a, in a little bit. Uh, actually, we're going to do sections 2.1 to 2.5, and some of those we're not going to hit too hard, like 2.4. Uh, those all deal with polynomial functions. Only 2.6 deals with rational function. We're not going to do 2.7. Okay, so let's get started then. Go back to our PowerPoints. Okay, and we'll go from current slide. Okay, there it is. And let's go from here. So chapter two is polynomial and rational functions. 2.1 to 2.5 are polynomial functions. 2.6 will be rational functions. We're going to do 2.1 first. We're going to start 
way back. We've been doing lots of things beyond this. Now we're going to go back to just quadratic functions and models. Okay, now what do we mean by quadratic functions? The maximum exponent is 2. There's no fractional exponents. They wouldn't be polynomials. Polynomials, the exponents can only be whole numbers. Could be 0, but 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, like that. With quadratic functions, the maximum exponent can be a 2. Could also have an exponent of 1 or an exponent of 0. That's all you've got. But you're used to quadratics, okay? So our objectives here are to analyze the graphs of quadratic functions. We'll write quadratic functions in standard form. That's going to be a little different than probably what you think it is. And use those results to sketch graphs of quadratic functions. What did I tell you? This book loves graphs. The first two objectives here are dealing with graphs. And then find the minimum and maximum values of quadratic functions in real life applications. You can look at those with graphs, but we'll be doing that algebraically mostly. Okay. So let's start with the graph of a quadratic function. We've already hit this before back in 1.5, I think it was, when we did the parent functions. Uh, no, 1.6 when we did the parent functions. We saw what the graph of what then we we're calling the squaring functions. This looks the same. In this section, you'll study the graphs of polynomial functions, mostly quadratic, but also polynomials. You were introduced to the following basic functions. This was called a linear function. Why? The maximum exponent is 1. When you plot the graph of that, it becomes a straight line. That's why they call it a linear function. It has a y-intercept of b, a slope of a. We know all about those, right? Even simpler than that is the constant function. Notice there is no a in that function, so therefore the slope is 0. So that's going to be a horizontal line. This, if a is anything other than 0, this will have either going up or down, it will have some slope. This has 0 slope, a slope of 0, horizontal, only has a y-intercept. And that's that same value for any value x will be, that's why we call it a constant function. And then we talked about the squaring function, this is back in 1.6, and this was it. And then in 1.7, we did translations of it and stretching, non-rigid transformations. We did other things with it. But these are all examples of polynomial functions. Very simple polynomial functions. Exponent 1, exponent 2. Polynomial functions could have an exponent of 17, 23, 85, 1416. No decimals, no fractions, no negatives only positive integers can be your exponents for a polynomial function and what's more they're separated by plus or minus signs the terms this has two terms these two only have one each that's what makes a polynomial so here's the definition of a polynomial function let n be a non-negative i remember i said it couldn't be negative integer no fractions no decimals no irrationals okay and let a sub n a sub n minus one a sub n minus two all the way down to a sub three a sub two a sub one a sub zero those are any real numbers in the world these can be real numbers these are only n is only integers the a's can be any real numbers in the world as long as a sub n that first one is not equal to zero i'll show you what why that's the case so here's your function f of x this is a polynomial function now this n here the subscript n really has no meaning or bearing on the problem at all it just identifies this is the coefficient that goes with that exponent that's the only reason they use a sub n so the first term when you write in descending order is a is x to the nth power okay and I'll tell you why this one can't be 0 in a minute okay this a sub n minus 1 just means this is the coefficient that goes with x 
raised to the n minus 1 power. So that just says this one goes with that one. And then you keep on going down the line till you get a sub 3 times x cubed, a sub 2 times x squared, a sub 1 times x to the first, a sub 0 times x to the 0. Well, x to the 0 is 1. Okay, so we don't even write it down. That's a polynomial function of x, f of x, polynomial function of x of degree n. Now that's why a sub n can't be 0. Because if a sub n was 0, this whole term is 0. And then this would be a polynomial of degree n minus 1, okay, not degree n. So for this to be degree n, that first coefficient cannot be 0. Any of these others could be zero, no sweat at all, but that first one can't be for it to be a polynomial of degree n. Okay, that's the only reason we said a sub n can't be zero. Okay, now notice every term has a variable raised to a positive integral fact, uh, exponent and may have a coefficient. Okay. Coefficients could be positive, negative, fraction, decimal, rational, irrational. It doesn't matter. Any real number except that first one can't be zero. The rest of them can be anything in the world. Real numbers. Okay. So polynomial functions are classified by degree. And that's why they said degree n. For instance, the constant function, uh, if c is not equal to zero, which I find it interesting they say that, has degree zero because the only x you see, which you don't see, would be x to the zeroth power, which would be 1. Okay, so that would just be c times 1. Okay, so that's degree 0. The linear functions are all degree 1, and quadratic functions are all second degree polynomial. The maximum exponent is a 2. Remember, all the exponents have to be positive integers. Okay? Any questions on this? Okay. Now, for instance, each of these following functions is a quadratic function. This one is because obviously the maximum exponent is 2. That's a 1. That's a 0. So that's 2. This one doesn't look like it has an exponent of 2, but if you were to square What's in the parentheses, that would be x squared plus 2x plus 1. Yep, the maximum exponent would be 2. This one, even though the coefficient is not an integer, the exponent has to be an integer, a positive integer, and it happens to be 2. That's a quadratic. The coefficient can be negative. No sweat there either, as long as the exponent is positive Two, the maximum exponent is positive two. Now this one doesn't have a exponent shown anywhere, but if you were to foil it, x times x is x squared. So that has a maximum exponent of two. Then you'd have a minus two x plus x would be minus x minus two. So that would be a a quadratic function. Note that the squaring function is a simple quadratic function that has degree 2. That's the one we were looking at before. That's it, the squaring function. That is your simplest, simplest, simplest quadratic function ever. Okay, coefficient of 1 and no translations, no stretching, shrinking, anything else. Okay, now, so here's the definition of a quadratic function. Now, this is probably how you're used to seeing a quadratic function written. Let a, b, and c be any real numbers in the world. Positive, negative, fractions, decimal, rational, irrational, it doesn't matter. a, b, and c, as long as that a is not zero. Okay? Then this function, f of x is equal to ax squared plus bx plus c, is a quadratic function. See, if the a were 0, that whole term would be 0, then that would be a linear function. It would not be quadratic. So that's the only reason they say a can't be 0. That's a quadratic function. Now, that should look familiar because that's how we used to write quadratic equations. We would say 
AX squared plus BX plus C is equal to zero, and then we'd go to town with that. So this has the same form, but here's the deal that what I just said with the equation equals zero, that would be your standard form for a quadratic equation. Later we'll see this is not the standard form for a quadratic function. It is a form of a quadratic function. It's the one we usually see, but it's not what we call the standard form. So we'll get to that later. The graph of a quadratic function is a special type of, and they call it a U-shaped curve, I would call it a smooth valley curve, okay? It U's go straight up. Uh, quadratic functions always go out a little bit. But what they mean by this, the bottom part is curved. It's not pointed, it's not cusp, it's not thing. It's a U-shaped curve, smooth but rounded at the bottom. That's called a parabola. Parabolas occur in many real-life applications. Now, I don't know if you realize this or not. Do any of you have any of the dishes for your television? Uh, Disc TV, Direct TV, those big old uh, things. If you've ever seen those things, those are parabolic in shape. Now that's a three-dimensional paraboloid and the reason they are parabolas is that incoming light rays or any kind of rays, radio waves, satellite waves coming in parallel when they hit a parabolic surface they all go to a focus and that's where the receiver is set right there and oh here's Jacaria she must have had to go out and come back in because she was here already. Yeah, I got her down. Okay. So, satellite dishes are parabolic shapes. Flashlight reflectors, that silvery looking thing behind the bulb, that we put the bulb in the focus, and then the light leaving that hits that, it goes out parallel. And that's why the flashlight gives you a beam of light rather than just a spread of light. Okay, if that were any other kind of mirror behind that, you wouldn't get a beam. Okay, not just that, uh, headlamps on your car. Notice this curve on those parabolic curve that reflecting surface behind the headlamp that's a parabolic curve. So you get a beam of light, not a scatter of light. Now there's a little bit of scatter, of course, and that's because the light bulb itself, which is set on the focus, is not at one particular point. It's at a, a variety of points, so those that are off a little give you the, the haze, but they're trying to set the, the main part right at the focus. Okay, and now my screen won't, slide won't advance. Oh my goodness gracious! We've run out of time. I did too much talking at the beginning. Sorry about that. Um, we will pick up here. This is basically the top of page 115. We didn't get enough done to do any homework exercises here. So we'll just go with uh, all the exercises before. Now, did anyone check to see if I gave you a test for, for the whole Thing. I can't remember. Okay, I thought I did. Okay, good deal. All right, now here's the next question. Do y'all want to make up the class for Thursday or not? Let me know. Yes or no? Anybody? Okay, no, it can't be this Friday. It cannot be this Friday. I'll be in an infusion lab on Friday. Yeah, and, yeah, next week. Okay. All right, so I, it feels like I'm hearing no. Now, here's another option. Out there on YouTube videos is a video that basically covers a little bit more material. If you want to just listen to the video, that can be done, and you just let me know where you quit listening or you know where the video ended. We could do that, or 
we can just pick up next Tuesday where we left off today. So which would you? Yeah. Okay. 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 Is that okay with everybody? I hate to cheat you out of a day of class, but can you? you yeah. Okay. Tuesday. Tuesday. We will not have class on Thursday, so I won't be putting a, uh, a Zoom invite out Wednesday night for this class. I'll put one out for the afternoon class on Thursday for a couple of you are in that, but I will not be putting a Zoom out for the uh, uh, for this class on Tuesday morning. So if you go looking for it and can't find it, or if some of your classmates say, hey, forgot to put a Zoom invite out, tell them what's happening. Okay obviously didn't listen to the YouTube video. This will be recorded. I am recording it. Um, I'll end this and put it on YouTube sometime tonight. Okay. Uh, I'll get this on the YouTube playlist. And uh, so folks, except for you guys who are in my class this afternoon, I guess I'll see you next Tuesday. Any questions? Yeah. Okay, that what? You 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 sort of garbled a little there. Okay, okay. I I realized right after I think I sent that one that I may not have posted it yet. I've got it in my grade book. Is that for the first test? Is that what it was talking about? It, okay, first test. Yeah. I, okay. Actually, either I put the thing in the wrong place or I don't have it. it. Okay, no, I think I know what it is. Wait, let me see. No, okay, no. What I said in that is that I will grade it when I can, and then I will place post the grade on Blackboard. I haven't gotten that one graded yet, okay? Sorry about that. Um, Here's the deal, folks. What I'm doing right now is printing off as much work as I can find because when I go to the infusion lab, I'll be sitting around there for probably a few hours. Uh, even after they start the stuff, they don't have the drug yet and they give me the pre stuff, I can grade papers like crazy then. So what I'm doing is printing off everything I can find now. I'll be taking them to the lab on uh, Thursday and Friday and grading as much as I can. Once the Benadryl hits, <laughs> I'm out, but you know, up until then, and usually I have about an hour or so each morning to grade, so I'll be grading papers then. If I can, today at noon, but at tw uh, one to three, but already I've got 10 messages came in this morning. I had one left over from yesterday. I don't know how much get done today. My lab today and this afternoon class probably won't take a full two hours. I may have a little bit of time today. If I can get it graded, I will. But if not, once I get it graded, then I post it on Blackboard. So I haven't finished grading yours yet. Sorry about that. Any other questions? Surely. Okay. It's due by the end of the term, but I'd rather you turn it in sooner. You get bonus points if you turn it in sooner than that. Like you still get two bonus points for turning it in. No, yes. In October, one in November, none in December. No bonus in December. Was someone else asking a question, Janae? Okay, your, your, okay, your, your sound is getting really garbled. Okay, okay, I, I can't understand. Huh? 
Okay. Your sound your sound is coming across really garbled and I can't make out what you're saying. Could you send it to me in an email? Hello, Janae? Something's wrong with either your microphone, my receiver, or the internet. Uh, but you are coming across really garbled. Okay. All right. I could understand most of that. I'll send it in an email. The rest of it, you get so slow, and I couldn't make out what you were saying. It was something to do with the. It was something to do with the uh, internet, I think. So. Uh, or your router or whatever. It happens to me too. So yeah, send it to me in an email. Now, <laughs> I'm behind on emails right now. I got tried to get catch up, caught up over the weekend, but all this other stuff was happening too. I'll get my head above water sometime or another. I just don't know when, but I'll do the best I can. Any other questions? All right, well, I'm going to stop sharing. And then if there are no other questions, I'll end the meeting. So let me know. A lot of, yes. I doubt it because I've got another class starting in seven minutes. And I've got to go to the bathroom. Okay. Well, like I say, I've got all this stuff going on. I'll get to it as soon as I can. But I'm behind in emails. Just understand that. It's not that I'm ignoring you. It's just that I've got tons of stuff going on right now but I'll try to get responded okay okay any other questions okay take care I'll see you next Tuesday some of you I'll see later today and hopefully on Thursday too but not in this class okay take care see you have a safe weekend folks be careful